Hi, I'm Debbie. It's a blessing to be speaking to you today from this sacred space, and I'm standing here for a very special reason. After many months of separation, the wait is finally over. This week, our church board met and unanimously agreed that it's time to start our return to in-person worship. With the low number of COVID cases locally and the ready availability of vaccines, we feel it safe to return to worship together in our building. Our first in-person worship experience here in our sanctuary will be Sunday, June 13th at 1045 a.m. In the next few weeks, we'll begin to share with you the special guidelines we'll put in place to ensure that everyone in this space is safe. Those who have been vaccinated and those who have not, including children and youth. Even as we return to the building, we also plan to continue our outdoor worship experience at Krug Park on the first Sunday of each month during the summer. And for those of you who have found our online worship experience a lifeline during this pandemic, let me assure you that those online worship services will continue each Sunday. Whether you join us for our ministries online, in person, or maybe a little of both, you are each an important part of this experiment in faith and ministry we call First Christian Church. And what exactly will our ministries look like in the days ahead? We need your help to begin a time of imagining and dreaming about where God's Spirit is leading us. Watch for a special email with a link to a quick online survey we urge each of you to fill out, sharing your thoughts, on who we are and who we can be as we follow God's compassionate invitation. And let me thank each and every one of you, whether you've been part of this church for years or you just joined us in the past few weeks, your commitment and your presence make all the difference as we continue to be a faithful, radically open and welcoming community centered in the grace of God and the way of Jesus.
I'm Nancy. Welcome to worship. Welcome to this sacred time together. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. If you are young or old, you are welcome. If you have brown skin, black skin, white skin, or any color of skin, you are welcome. If you are married or single, you are welcome. If you are gay or straight, you are welcome. If you are transgender, you are welcome. If you cannot hear or see, you are welcome. If you are sick or well, you are welcome. If you are happy or sad, you are welcome. If you are rich or poor, powerful or weak, you are welcome. If you believe in God some of the time, or none of the time, or all of the time, you are welcome. Come with your gifts, your pain, your hope, your fears. Come with the traditions that have helped you and hurt you. Come with your experiences that have made you and broken you. Come with a mind ready to engage and a heart open to discern. Come and listen for the sacred spirit that calls you to love your neighbor, seek justice, create peace, and practice compassion. You are welcome here. Pastor Brian here. It's great to have you with us today for this time of sacred worship together. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It's the Sunday in the church that we tell the story of the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples. And so it's often a day that we think about how the Holy Spirit is moving still within the church today. The Spirit is that symbol that we, we use to think about newness about God bringing a change, God leading us in new directions and new paths. And that's certainly true for us right now as a church. There's all sorts of new things happening. We're getting ready to return to in-person worship and in-person gatherings as part of who we are as a church. We are asking you right now to respond to an online survey, which you'll find linked in the description of today's video that is your chance to share with us about where do you think we're going as a church and who are we being called to be and what new ministries might we explore together and what's it gonna look like when we finally do gather again in person as, and continue to gather online and how do we bring those two different communities together in a shared sense of ministry and mission and purpose as God's faithful people. And so today, as we gather for this time of worship, I invite you to think about where's God's Spirit moving? Not just within our faith community, but within your own life. Are there new things happening? Is God challenging you to do something different? Is God asking you to use your resources, your time, your talents in new and different ways that might uh, be a, a conduit of God's love and grace, justice and peace for those in your life and those that you encounter? So today is a day to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes to us again and again. The question always is, are we paying attention? Are we listening? And will we follow? I'm glad that you're with us today. Let's continue to worship together. more than 
just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Who won't you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing? You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am Hi, I'm Carol Pittman, co-chair of our Christian Education Ministry. Today, we want to take a few minutes to celebrate the education ministries of our church. Of the many things that could be said to define who we are at First Christian, we are without a doubt a community of learners. We know what it means to honestly wrestle with scripture, to struggle with theological challenges, and to keep our minds open to the many ways of understanding the Bible, Jesus, God, and the life of faith. As followers of Jesus, one often referred to as rabbi, we know the value of learning, of striving to know more of God's creation and all that it has to offer. And so today, we wish to honor those in our faith community who have reached a new destination in their lifelong journey of learning, graduating this spring with degrees in higher education. Today, we pray a special blessing on Beth McClanahan, our Director of Music, graduating with a Bachelor's of Music in Technology and Performance from Missouri Western State University. Harrison Mears, graduating with a dual degree in biochemistry and molecular biology and biology with a concentration in botany, with a minor in French. Harrison admits to being a bit of an overachiever. Félicitations, Harrison. And finally, Jesse Lent, graduating with a Master's in Divinity from Central Baptist Theological Seminary. Jesse's degree is one of the last steps toward his ordination in Christian ministry, happening in June. As a sign of our blessing and support for each of these friends in Christ, our congregation will be giving them each a gift on your behalf to inspire the next step on their faith and educational journeys. Let us pray. Creator God, we give thanks for this day and for the lives of these graduates. Give them strength, give them courage, give them a vision of the person you have created them to be. Endow them with the grace of kindness and compassion. Awaken their minds to the wholeness of your creation and a curiosity to seek you wherever they may go. May your blessings be with them always. Amen.
Our reading from the Gospel of Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. The parable of the wedding banquet. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. In recent surveys, when people in our country are asked to describe what comes to mind when they think of the Christian faith, guess which word is often at the top of the list. Sadly, and for many of us, maybe unsurprisingly, One of the top descriptors of Christianity is judgmental. Judgmental. How did we so successfully take a 2,000 year old faith with its origins in Jesus' teachings of grace and love and justice and peace and turn it into a message of judgment? Think of the irony of claiming what we have is good news to offer and then someone says, oh, I could use some good news, what is it? And we respond, well, the good news is God loves you unconditionally on the condition that you believe the right things and you say the right things and you behave the right way and you belong to the right church. Otherwise, you are condemned for all eternity. Think that's a caricature? Well, for many people, this is exactly what they understand the Christian faith to be all about. And where did they learn this version? I would argue this corruption of the good news of Christianity. Well, you guessed it right. They learned it from the church itself. But before we start getting too judgmental ourselves, let's not put all the blame on the church because if you're looking for condemnation and judgment, you don't have to look any further than the scriptures themselves. Take today's parable of the wedding feast. As it appears in Matthew, it seems to be yet another parable of the early church and the history of salvation. Much like our parable last week, the so-called parable of the wicked tenants, it's often assumed in today's parable that the king offering the feast is God, the son is Jesus, the subjects that reject the invitation to the feast are the people of Israel, the servants that are beaten and killed are the prophets, And the violence of the king represents the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And the second group of invitees are foreigners and others outside of the Jewish faith. And that's all well and good. But here's my question about this parable. Maybe it's yours too. What's with all the violence? 
If this is, as Matthew suggests, a window into the kingdom of God, what are we to make of the way Matthew chooses to depict that kingdom? Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine has this to say about today's parable. The parable of the wedding banquet is disturbing in its violence. It ends with dead slaves, a burned city, dinner guests who are compelled to attend the party, and an expelled guest doomed to torture because he lacked the right outfit. That any of this speaks to what the kingdom of heaven is like should come as a surprise. If the parable is about salvation, then it is about a type of salvation in which free will is obviated. If the parable is about the grace of the divine, then it is a grace that burns an entire city because of the sin of a few of its citizens. If the parable is about the messianic banquet, then it is a banquet that nobody cares to eat. If the Lord or King in the parable is God, then we should wonder if this is the type of God we want to worship. Levine has a point, doesn't she? I mean, imagine lifting just this parable out of Scripture and trying to offer this to someone as a description of life in the kingdom of God. I'm not exactly sure what sort of reaction you'd get, but do we imagine that we're likely to grow the church or better yet change lives with that sort of approach or with this particular tidbit of Holy Scripture? But not to worry, we have a few other options. We could, of course, ignore this parable in Matthew and instead turn to the version of it that we find in Luke's gospel. Luke's retelling is, is full of the radical welcome of God that we love to speak about without a hint of violence or judgment. Or we could do what I suggested for last week's parable and turn to the non-canonical gospel of Thomas. There we find a much earlier and simpler version of this little story, minus the allegorizing and again, minus the violence. But I hear you saying, that doesn't really solve the problem, does it? Matthew's version is, is still there. It's still part of Holy Scripture. What are we to do with his juxtaposition of kingdom of God, punishing violence, and divine judgment? To that question, I would respond, Scripture, like Jesus himself, can be seen as both human and divine. Scripture offers us glimpses of God's amazing grace, and it offers more, more than a few glimpses into our, at times, broken humanity. Our scriptures represent a constant struggle or tension amongst the biblical writers between the notion of divine grace and the seeming human need for judgment. Our scriptures, read from beginning to end, are a story of God's offering of distributive justice, where everyone is cared for and has enough, and our human desire for retributive justice, where the evil are punished and the good are rewarded. It would be easy to simply look for grace in Scripture and ignore the judgment and the violence that the biblical writers can't seem to resist inserting into the narrative. But is that honest? It would be easy to say, well, yes, Matthew uses violence in his parable, but it's just symbolism. You aren't meant to take it literally. To which I would respond, true, but why use violent symbolism to depict the kingdom of God in the first place? We can discount the violence as just a story, but is that honest? Given that we know of the violent world from which scripture comes, and given that we still live in a violent world today. Think of the, the violent incident that ignited the street protests for racial justice this past summer. Handcuffed and lying face down in the asphalt street, George Floyd gasped for breath as officer Derek Chauvin knelt on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds until he died. We all saw the video. We saw it for exactly what it was, a violent act by one in power over one who was powerless. An act of retributive justice, an act of judgment and punishment. 
But it didn't take long before that narrative began to shift and change, before some began asking about George Floyd's background and his past mistakes and whether or not he had committed a crime or, or whether or not he was to blame himself or whether or not he deserved his fate. The incident became a, a flashpoint, even a symbol for those on all sides of the Black Lives Matter debate and the, the Blue Lives Matter debate and the All Lives Matter debate. And it would have been easy to get caught up in the rhetoric and the finger pointing, turning George Floyd into nothing more than a symbol, a story, maybe even a parable. And yet, there was the video. Try as we might to turn away, to make excuses for the violence, the video was there confronting us, calling out the brokenness of a culture too focused on violence and judgment rather than grace and transformation. Just as that video calls us to see our violence for what it is, there is something to be said for calling out Christian language, Christian ideas, Christian proclamations and assertions and assumptions when they fall short of the radical gospel truth of grace and compassion and mercy, nonviolence, justice, and love. There's something to be said for calling out violent and judgmental corruptions of that gospel message, even when they're spoken by church authorities, even when they're professed by preachers in the pulpit, even when they come from the voice of Scripture itself. So we can choose to look away from the violence in today's parable, or excuse it, or we can confront it call it what it is, and perhaps even dare to tell a different story, one more centered in God's amazing grace. Just as Matthew and his community are a voice within the history of the church, are we not part of that voice too, in our time and in our place? If God's spirit of truth and grace is still speaking, and I believe that it is, is it not possible that that same spirit speaks through us too, as First Christian Church. And what story, what parable is it inviting us to tell together in the time ahead of us? Amen. Hi everyone, I'm Katie. Let's take a moment to pray together. What is on your heart this morning? Who are you thinking of? What concerns weigh on your soul this morning? Take a moment to think of them, maybe speak them aloud or drop them in the chat below as we meet together in God's presence. Let's meditate for a moment in silence. Let us pray. Creative Spirit, source of love, you open us to new life, new hope, new possibilities for a future lived in and through you. You open our hearts to feel your compassion for those who have been excluded from the feast of your kingdom. You open our ears to hear the cries of suffering in ways that we cannot fail to be moved. You open our mouths to speak truth that will build rather than tear down, create rather than destroy. And so we pray today for peace in the Middle East 
and other corners of the world where your people choose retributive justice and violence instead of reconciliation. We pray for healing for those countries around the globe where COVID-19 continues to be a major threat to public health. We pray for those in our country who face the injustice of racism each and every day. We pray for those on the streets of our communities who are desperately in need of shelter, financial assistance, and mental health resources. And we pray for all of those who are hearing this today, for the needs each of us carry, many in the privacy of our own hearts, as we seek healing of body, mind, and spirit. Source of love. You open our understanding to new ways of living that do not diminish anyone. You open our eyes to see a vision of this world as you would have it to be. Give us the courage to continue to seek your presence. Give us the courage to make that world a reality. Give us the courage to seek the beauty of the world and the needs of the stranger and the cries for justice and within our own hearts. Amen. We gather now around the table of communion. This is a table where all are welcome and all their God-given diversity, so you are welcome here too. You're invited to use whatever you have at hand to use as the bread and cup, or you may simply participate symbolically today. So remember with me the story of our faith. Scripture tells us how Jesus took bread, how he blessed it, he broke it, And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body, my life, which is lived for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we remember how after the supper, he took the cup and he poured out the wine and he gave it to them saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sin. And I tell you, I won't drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of God's love. Let us share now in the Lord's Prayer using whatever words are most familiar to you. Our Creator, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm 
trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So may no things be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are the firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Maybe as we journey now into this new week, we could think of ourselves as those who celebrate at the sort of wedding feast where all are truly welcome, where love flows with abundance, and where there is a seat of honor at the table for each of God's precious children. How might we, in the week ahead, help to create glimpses of that sort of wedding feast wherever we go, in the ways that we treat others, in our attention to true justice, in our practice of peace, and in our call to share God's amazing grace. Go now, knowing you are one of those who God welcomes to the wedding feast. Go now, knowing your own belovedness. Go in peace. Amen.